Hello, my name is Madeline Spencer, and I have been working in downtown Santa Ana for the past seven years for Santa Ana Business Council. I'm one of the co-creators of Boca de Oro, Mouth of Gold Festival, which regularly takes place within our downtown. This year, we've gone virtual, as you can see, and the festival would not have been possible without our gold sponsor and partnership with Community Engagement. And this year, we received our very first grant from the California Arts Council, and we've been fortunate to have amazing partnerships with the Santa Ana Unified School District, the Santa Ana Business Council, and Downtown Inc. And this year, we also had the help of the Orange County Transportation Authority to assist us taking this festival digital. We also want to thank the city of Santa Ana for helping us to cultivate a creative capital at the center of Orange County, California. And before I introduce our keynote, I'd like to give you as the audience an opportunity to put any questions for the speaker into the chat while listening, because following the keynote, there's going to be a question and answer period that's led by my co-creative partner in this festival, Robin McNair, the visual and performing arts coordinator for the district. She's going to be asking the questions that you have shared after the talk with Mr. Souza. So let me tell you about our keynote and why we asked him to come to, to our festival this year. In Pete Souza's documentary, The Way I See It, one of the things that I recognized was this incredible image of a Black man, happily married, well-adjusted, raising his two children and a nation compassionately. I realized in watching it that I had never seen this image of an African-American man ever what we know of African-Americans is mostly divided families, mothers raising their children alone, fathers incarcerated, or mothers continuously evicted or pushed out, folks living rough in our streets, aging and dying under the elements somewhere. And this alternative image alone shocked my senses with an understanding of a different world. We in Santa Ana, California, we live in a fragmented community filled with fear oftentimes. Fear from everything from hunger to deportation. We have divided families struggling in impacted neighborhoods. And the model of being able to raise your children with safety, dignity, and love was aspirational. And without the interference of factors that divide us from our families each day. And I felt that in this film, it was a very powerful model. I wish it was true for all of us. And it was this grasping at an image and a model that provided a way of believing in that possibility. And as my co-creator Robin McNair likes to say, seeing is believing. And this was a very powerful expression that made us reach out to Pete Sosa and ask him if he would please come and speak with us this year in our community. And um, let me now introduce you to our keynote speaker. The documentary, The Way I See It, which compelled us to reach out, was based on the New York Times number one bestseller, An Intimate Portrait and Shade. The Way I See It is an unprecedented look behind the scenes of two of the most iconic presidents in American history, Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan, as seen through the eyes of renowned photographer Pete Souza, an official White House photographer, and as an official White House photographer, Souza is an eyewitness to the unique and tremendous responsibilities of being the most powerful person on earth. The movie revealed how Souza transforms from a respected photojournalist to a searing commentator on the issues we face as a country and as a people. Pete has lectured many times on his photography, including at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, Harvard University, Boston University, and has appeared on ABC's 2020 Dateline, NBC, CBS, Sunday Morning, NBC Nightly News, Fox News Sunday, and Fox Friends and Family. I'd like to now introduce you with no further ado to our keynote. Pete Souza, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks, Madeline. Thanks for being here. And um, I thought what I was going to do today is uh, give a presentation of some of my uh, photographs, mostly of uh, President Obama. But, but I also, I, I thought it was important to start out with a few pictures of um, President Reagan and how the experience that I had from um, that presidency really helped prepare me 
um, for the job with President Obama. So I am going to share my screen. Um, and if uh, hopefully you can all see, uh, uh, this is just the title slide. And if um, you can't see this, please, uh, those of you in charge, just let me know. Um, and I, and I, and I will say too that as, as we start to go through the photographs, um, I have these set for my monitor. So if they're a little dark, then you should just adjust the brightness on your laptop or computer. Uh, or phone, uh, and, and vice versa. So let's get started. So really, when I was a very young man, still in my 20s, just through a, an odd occurrence, I, I, I was offered this opportunity to be an official White House photographer uh, during the Obama administration. And, you know, the job is um, you're, you're documenting the everyday activities of the uh, president, and all the pictures end up at the National Archives. This was a, a remote picture with a wide angle lens in the Oval Office. And this is uh, of him during a cabinet room. So I think it's important to point out that um, all of these photographs that I'm showing you today, they're all candid. They're all uh, uh, kind of fly on the wall where I'm just kind of hanging around and um, trying to make these uh, candid pictures that, that sh you know, show what was going on. This was, some of you are probably too young to remember this, but this was in 1986 when the space shuttle Challenger exploded. He didn't actually watch it live. He was in the Oval Office during a meeting, and when somebody ran in and said the Challenger just exploded, he ran back to his little dining room, and there was a little black and white TV set up, and this is them watching um, the, the the replay. And it, you know, if if you if you put politics aside for a moment in terms of whether you agree or disagree with the policies of President Reagan. The, the, the thing that I admired is he was a decent human being and he was an empathetic human being. And I think that was the, the one thing that we uh, were missing the last uh, four years. Uh, but this was after a terrorist attack in Beirut where 241 Mar US Marines were killed. And about a week later, they had a memorial service um, at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And here he is greeting some of those that were injured. Um, when you're the official White House photographer, you're also photographing him when he's on vacation or uh, in, in very personal uh, moments. This is at his ranch just up the road in, uh, um, in California, just north of Santa Barbara. Um, and, you know, and I made some pretty intimate pictures uh, during, a pres during his presidency, including this one after Nancy Reagan had been, uh, had, had, had gotten breast cancer and had had surgery. Um, and every day he, after work, he would take the Marine One helicopter from the White House to Bethesda Naval Hospital to visit his wife. Um, and here she is. Uh, this is an, on one of those visits. Um, it, I, I did many things after I left the Reagan White House. I was a freelance photographer for a number of years. I worked for the Chicago Tribune for a number of years. But in 2004, when uh, President Reagan died, Nancy Reagan asked me to be the official photographer for the funeral. So I just want to show a few of those pictures. Um, the, the, president Bush, who was, who was then president in 2004, he actually sent Air Force One out to California to pick up Reagan's body and, and fly it back to D.C. where he lied and stayed at the Capitol. And they removed the chairs or the seats uh, in the guest section of the plane and strapped in uh, his, his casket. And at some point during the flight, Mrs. Reagan came back. I don't think I would have been able to make this picture uh, if, if I hadn't already had, uh, you know, a good relationship with uh, Nancy Reagan. I think she allowed me to, to be there. This is now in D.C. They had a funeral mass at the National Cathedral. All the former presidents came. 
And then we got on the plane and flew back to California and they had the burial service um, in Simi Valley at the Reagan Library. And then this is just before they um, lowered the casket into the ground. That's her, uh, um, her two kids. And then uh, Michael Reagan, who um, was adopted um, when he was married, when President Reagan was married to Jane Wyatt it's in the background. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that I had worked for the Chicago Tribune, but I was based in Washington, D.C. I covered things all over the world, but I also covered some politics. And in 2004, that same year, actually, as the funeral, uh, just, um, God, it was like a month later, um, I um, followed John Kerry. He was, gonna, he was the nominee for the Democrats for the president that year. So I followed him for about six weeks leading up to the convention. Uh, and while I was at the convention, my, my photo editor at the Chicago Tribune had said to me, make sure you get a picture of Obama if he comes up on stage at the very end. And I was like, I didn't, know, I didn't even know who he was. But I did manage to get a picture. This is that same night in 2004. Um, and then a few months later, he was elected to the Senate uh, in November of 2004. And uh, uh, because I was based in D.C., a, a correspondent in the Washington Bureau for the Tribune, and I uh, decided to, to follow Obama's first couple of years in the Senate. And because we were the, the quote unquote hometown newspaper, I got access that, that uh, no other photographer got. This is uh, in his first week. Uh, he got like the worst office in the Senate, had no windows, was in the basement. Um, and I thought this was kind of a, an interesting picture. And, and if he ever did, you know, run for president someday, this, this would be even a more interesting um, picture. And I was actually thinking that as I was making this picture. And then this was the, 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 actually the first day that I met him when he came to Washington, Washington for the ceremonial swearing in for uh, as a U.S. senator. And he brought his family with him. Malia and Sasha were six and three, I believe. And he's eating a sandwich in his little cubbyhole office. And you see Sasha eyeing the other half. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've just met this guy. And I'm in this very intimate situation. And it's as if he doesn't care. It's like he's letting me photograph whatever's happening. And that's pretty uh, unusual for a politician, especially a young politician. And I knew then that he would be like a good photographic subject because of that. This is him running up the steps of the Capitol to, um, uh, to, to vote on the Senate floor, which is, you know, you look at this picture and you compare it to what happened on January 6th. Um, I, as senator, I traveled with him to, I think, six countries, including Russia, where you can see nobody even recognized him. This is in Red Square. And then um, in February 2007, so I had been photographing him now for two years already, um, he decided he was going to run for president. And this is the moment before he walks out to make his announcement. And I, can, I think you can see the anxiety in everybody's face. Um, and I, 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 tell, I tell people in retrospect that... Um, He's, he's about to walk out the door and his life will never be the same again. Um, I'm going to skip the campaign uh, and go right to the presidency. Um, but uh, a couple of weeks before the inauguration, I mean, you have to realize that I, by, by then I had developed a professional relationship with him. So he knew me. He knew how I worked. He, he was familiar with my photographs. Um, and so in a couple of weeks before uh, the uh, inauguration, he uh, got a phone call. He wanted to be, be the chief official White House photographer. There was no interview. Um, it was just a matter of, you know, uh, offering me the job and me saying, um, I need to have access to everything. Um, and he agreed. I mean, my goal going in 
was to create the best photographic archive of a president that had ever been done. I think because I already knew uh, Barack Obama, had already known Barack Obama for four years, um, because I was a seasoned photojournalist, I had been doing this for a long time, and because I had had the previous experience in the Reagan White House, I thought I was in a unique position um, to, to, to really uh, document his presidency for history. Um, this is just before he's to walk out and take the oath of office. I show this just to remind Donald Trump that the biggest crowd in history at an inauguration was really on January 20th, 2009. But it was these pictures that I was trying to achieve, these behind the scenes moments. Um, I, I sort of had in the back of my mind the word authentic authenticity. This was in a freight elevator inauguration night going from one inaugural ball to another. And, and, to, and to give you a sense of how I, I worked, I, I used what I called um, a small footprint. So I, so I only carried a couple of cameras, quiet cameras, one with a wide angle lens, one with the telephoto lens. Um, I didn't use a flash. I didn't use like a motor drive. So I was kind of very stealthy about what I did. So I could go like right behind him and almost show things from his perspective. And you can see nobody's even looking at me. They're just listening to what he's saying. Um, I always tell people that I think photographs are an important historical record, not to just show who's in the room, but to, to show the mood and the, and the emotion of what's, of what's taking place. This was on a Sunday night. He was about to call to the automobile companies um, who were in very dire straits to tell them that the federal government was going to take over their companies. And uh, for those of you that were really <laughs> Young in 2009, we were dealing with a big financial crisis. So that uh, dominated many of the photographs I made that, that first year. This is one of those meetings uh, on the economy. He's just trying to take in what uh, people are telling him. And I was also looking for like these kind of storytelling pictures where you don't necessarily see him, see his face, but this gives you a real good sense of how involved he was in the writing and editing of his speeches. This was an early healthcare speech that he had been working on with uh, John Favreau. And I think it was about a 12 page speech. Um, and after he had taken this up to the residence overnight to, to edit, this is, he came back and every page looked like this. Um, this was the day that um, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act. In, in 2010, they watched the, the House vote on a, a big screen TV in the Roosevelt Room. And just to give you some uh, you know, idea of what my day was like, this, is a, this happened to be a Sunday. Um, this picture was taken, I don't know, 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Um, but I'd been working all day, and he had been working all day. Um, and to give you an idea, this is one of 1,475 pictures that I made on that particular day. Um, I'm going to show you some uh, personal moments with his uh, uh, wife and, uh, and with his kids, uh, kind of to echo what Madeline was uh, talking about. This was at the, the governor's ball, which is... Uh, it was a formal uh, black tie dinner at the end of a day of meetings with all the nation's governors. Uh, here he is singing happy birthday to Michelle uh, in 2013. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we were on a boat ride on the Gulf Coast and I saw Michelle stroking his hand. And so I made this close up picture. And I think it tells you something about their relationship, even though you don't see them per se. Um, you know, he talks a lot about uh, what it was like growing up with essentially without a dad. And, um, um, you know, he was essentially brought up by his mom and his grandparents. And I think he did not 
uh, want to uh, be like his dad. So when, when they had kids, I mean, he was all in as dad. Now, you would think that would be somewhat hard to do as a, as a, as a president, but I think it helped that, um, you know, he lived above the store, if you will. And so if he wasn't traveling, he had dinner with his family every night. Uh, one day after school, he saw Malia on the swing set outside the Oval Office and just walked outside and spent a few minutes catching up on her day. This is with Sasha at a barbecue on the South Lawn some weekend. And, and there were some occasions um, during, uh, during the summer or spring breaks, if he was doing an, an international trip, he might bring the family along. Um, this was at, um, uh, in South Africa. He went to Robben Island to visit uh, Nelson Mandela's cell. And um, they're listening to the tour guide. But it wasn't a normal tour guide. It was somebody that had been imprisoned with Mandela uh, for 16 years and was giving a firsthand account of what it was like to live in this cell block. Um, I, I always like this series. I think it, it really uh, <laughs> gives you an idea of what he's like as a dad. Um, there was a big snowstorm in DC. Uh, I had to sleep in my office because I wasn't able to wasn't sure I'd be able to get home or get back to the White House the next day, which was a Saturday. And I figured he'd come out at some point because the kids were still young. And sure enough, uh, they came out right in the middle of the snowstorm. There they are on the South Lawn. This is in the Rose Garden. And you see what Sasha is about to do. Yes, she did it. And to this day, this is the picture that he has as a lock screen photo on his iPad of he and the girls doing uh, snow angels on the South Lawn. Um, another family trip to Rio de Janeiro. This is at the Christ the Redeemer. And, you know, like I tell people, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I had as my main subject someone who is very recognizable <laughs> from behind. You can clearly tell that's him. You know, one of the other things I was trying to do, too, is also uh, show what it was like inside the presidential bubble. Even if you didn't, even if it didn't tell you anything specific about President Obama, it kind of gave a feeling of what it was like to be uh, in the apparatus of the presidency. So this is uh, Air Force One leaving Seattle on a foggy morning and uh, Marine One is helicopter coming in the land and Petra Jordan. This was the the night that the Supreme Court upheld same-sex marriage and they lit the White House in rainbow colors. Um, and, you know, probably one of the more historic days was the Bin Laden raid. We're actually coming up to the 10th anniversary in May, believe it or not. Um, but I have to tell you first, before I uh, talk about the raid itself, I mean, the, the, the psyche of the country during 9-11, and those of you that are young, um, you, you know, we're too young to experience this. But we all have our stories about where we were on 9-11 and how it affected us. I happen to, even though I lived in D.C., I happened to be in Chicago. I was supposed to fly home. Uh, I had a one o'clock flight on 9-11. Obviously, that didn't happen, and I ended up driving back to D.C. I arrived uh, early the next morning, made this photograph of the damage to the Pentagon, um, and then went up to New York, spent a couple of weeks in New York, and there were these kind of posters about bin Laden all over town, the mastermind of 9-11. And then a few weeks later, I found myself uh, crossing the Hindu Kush mountains in Afghanistan to try to get close to Kabul where the fighting was taking place. Uh, we made it. Uh, and we hooked up with this ragtag group of soldiers. This is before there were any U.S. troops on the ground. And it was very kind of a haphazard uh, uh, situation. Um, but here they are marching to the front line. And there's a tank trying to look for the Taliban. Um, these are called the Northern Alliance, uh, these soldiers. 
And um, that's a, a B-52 U.S. Uh, bomber drop in the background. And this is a guy that had uh, stepped on a landmine. His foot was blown off. And then the next day, as we headed to, into Kabul, as Kabul fell, um, some of the Taliban were executed just right on the roadside. I'll just skip over that real quick. And then you can see people celebrating uh, in Kabul. Um, and they were like jumping. We had a pickup truck and they were trying to get into our pickup truck. <laughs> so back to the Bin Laden raid. So, you know, all this was going through my mind during the Bin Laden raid, the whole experience of 9-11. It had been 10 years that we were tracking this guy down. And these are just some of the meetings that took place throughout that day on May 1st, 2011. You can sort of see the intensity in his face. And then as they watch the raid, this is a picture you, you might be familiar with. This is actually watching the raid in the afternoon. And the one thing I'll say about it is uh, you've got the most powerful people in the executive branch of our government. They're used to making decisions to, you know, affecting things. And in this particular instance, there is nothing they could do. I mean, they had made their decision. Now it's totally up to those special forces guys on the ground. And so in some essence, they were powerless. And I think uh, you can imagine the tension and anxiety that was taking place. And I think you can see it in their faces. These are some of the other pictures that were taken in that one little room. Now I'll point to the bottom right picture after they knew they had gotten bin Laden. And yet it's just a very mute, muted reaction. There wasn't any like high fives taking place or anything like that. And then about seven hours later, something like that, um, they decided they were going to make the news public. Um, the first person he called was George W. Bush. Since 9-11 had happened on his watch, and he was, uh, uh, his administration had been uh, trying to hunt down bin Laden too. And then just before he made his remarks, as he was editing a speech, the news started leaking out. And I saw the a video of bin Laden playing on a little TV set outside the Oval Office. And here he is making the speech. And then a couple of days later, we went to uh, New York City. They, he went to the firehouse that lost the most number of guys on 9-11 um, and had lunch and toasted in their memory. Now, I, I, I think you would say that the, the, the worst day for him was the day of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings. Um, that morning, John Brennan on the left, who was the Homeland Security Advisor, came up and briefed President Obama throughout the morning, as uh, you can imagine, the information coming in was pretty sketchy at first. Uh, and then when he nailed down, after talking to the FBI and local officials, that 26 people had been killed, including 20 kids. They didn't know at the time. They were just first graders. Um, and I think he's reacting as, a, as any parent would, imagining that horror of sending your six-year-old kid off to school on the school bus and sending them, off, sending them off to what we all consider a safety zone. And then, you know, just a few hours later, you're having to identify your child's body. Uh, he thought it was important for him to speak to the nation uh, when there's a national tragedy like this. And I'm going to show you this uh, little video clip of his, some of his remarks. The majority of those who died today were children, uh, beautiful little kids between the ages of five and 10 years old. They had their entire lives ahead of them, birthdays, graduations, weddings, kids of their own.
Among the fallen were also teachers, men and women who devoted their lives to helping our children fulfill their dreams. So our hearts are broken today. And then uh, this is later that afternoon. Um, it was Christmas time at the White House. So every afternoon and every evening, there would be a big, huge party on the state floor. And he was going to make remarks. I followed him up to the residence. He was going to pick up Michelle. Uh, and Malia had just gotten home from school. And he just latched onto her and and wouldn't let her go. And interesting, I'll play this uh, an, another audio clip from those remarks that uh, he had just made. And it just so, so ties into this photo. This evening, Michelle and I will do what I know every parent in America will do, which is hug our children a little tighter. And we'll tell them that we love them. And we'll remind each other how deeply we love one another. But there are families in Connecticut who cannot do that tonight. And they need all of us right now. Two days later, we went to Newtown uh, for a memorial service. Um, before the uh, service, he spent uh, more than two hours meeting with each of the families individually who had just had you know, the greatest shock happen to them. This is Francine and David Wheeler uh, showing President Obama pictures of their son, Ben, who is six in first grade. He was shot and killed. Um, th this is their older son, Nate, in the foreground. Uh, Nate was in, I can't remember, third or fourth grade at the same school, and he hid in a school supply closet during the shooting, but heard all the shots ring out. And here he is uh, uh, hugging Francine. And then after doing this with each of the families, he retreated to an empty classroom to gather his thoughts before going to the public memorial service where he made remarks. I'll just read a couple lines from what he said that night. This is our first task, caring for our children. It's our first job. If we don't get that right, we don't get anything right. That's how, as a society, we will be judged. He usually ran up these steps uh, that night. Uh, uh, he walked ever so slowly because I think all the emotion was just completely drained out of him. So um, one of the things that I... I was always trying to photograph were these candid interactions that he had with other people, because I, th I thought it really showed what he was like as a human being, how he interacted with others. This is with uh, his then vi vice president, our now president, before a campaign event. And after giving the eulogy at uh, Joe Biden's son, Bo's uh, funeral, Bo had died of a brain tumor A um, couple of pictures with world leaders. This is Angela Merkel of Germany, who I, I, I think was probably his closest other head of state because she was chancellor of Germany all eight years that he was president. So they had a very uh, unique relationship. And then with Vladimir Putin of Russia, he had a very different kind of relationship with Putin. And then, you know, he is, um, as uh, Madeline said, the first black president. And that certainly came into my photography, looking for those moments that uh, symbolically uh, showed that. And here's a young kid, Jacob Philadelphia, um, who had told the president that his friend, friends had said his haircut was just like President Obama's. With that, President Obama bent over. Jacob touched his head. You know, and I think the picture really resonated with kids of color uh, because here's a young African-American kid touching the president of the United States that looks like him. And kind of a similar picture. This is a little boy, Clark Reynolds, at a reception at the White House, looking up at the president. Um, he appointed the first Latina Supreme Court justice. And this is them um, prior to 
um, her investor vestiture ceremony at the Supreme Court. And the funny thing about the Supreme Court is you, you're not allowed to go into the chambers with a camera. So I wasn't allowed to go in. But like sort of backstage, I had free reign to make pictures like that. Um, this is with a Rohingya refugee uh, in Malaysia. Her name is Anna. Uh, just actually two years, it was a year, year and a half ago, somebody that volunteers at this uh, uh at this cl classroom in Malaysia uh, sent me a picture of, of uh, Anna today. She's still at the school. Um, and so I, I, uh, I, I did send it to Pr President Obama. So you got to see Anna today. She, I think she was at a soccer meet or something. This is at the Cleveland West Side Market in 2012. I thought, that, I thought you might find this kind of interesting. So he had made remarks at the Paramount Theater in Austin. Um, and while he was giving a speech, there were these two guys heckling him, but they were pro-immigration, and so was he, but they didn't feel he had gone on long enough. I mean, had, had, had done enough, and that's why they were heckling him. So he shouted back at them. Um, uh, he said, uh, look, just please shut up now. And when I'm finished speaking, you can come backstage and we can have a discussion. Like who does that? So this was uh, after he had given the speech, he was working the rope line. You can sort of see how excited people were and how anxious the secret service were. You see both of them trying to, they don't like it when people are grabbing him, especially around the head. And then as he was walking backstage, you see him, he's motioning to those two guys that had been heckling him. And he's saying like, you know, for real, come backstage. And you can see the secret service guy on the right who's anticipating what's about to happen. And sure enough, they came back. And it was really interesting. I love watching the uh, secret service agent in the background, just totally keep an eye on, this, on these two guys. Uh, so they had a discussion for about 10 minutes. I just thought that was kind of interesting. He and Michelle uh, uh, met with a group of activists on the mall, on the National Mall, when they were staging a public fast in order to pressure Congress to pass an immigration bill in 2013. Um, he would visit wounded soldiers at Walter Reed every three or four months. I went on all those visits. This one was particularly uh, poignant in that uh, this is Corey Remsburg, an army ranger who had been uh, severely injured in Afghanistan. The guy that he was on patrol with was killed instantly by an IED. Corey was uh, thrown up into the air, landed face down underwater in a ravine. Somehow he didn't drown. Somehow they saved his life, but he had a traumatic brain injury. But the thing that was really kind of a punch in the gut is, is that it turns out that President Obama had met Corey uh, seven months before uh, during a, a, the anniversary of D-Day. Uh, Corey had been an army ranger who had parachuted in as part of the ceremony and got to meet President Obama backstage or outside. Um, <clears throat> and here he is shaking hands with President Obama. And this, we had sent pictures to the family, and this picture was taped to the hospital room wall. So I'm looking at the picture, and then I'm looking at Corey, and I'm saying to myself, my God, this is the, the real true cost of war right here. I'm looking right at it. And um, I think as we left the room, um, uh, usually the only people that would go in the hospital room would be me, the president, one Secret Service agent, and the military aide. And as, uh, as, as, as we uh, had walked out of the room, I looked at President Obama and he looked at me and we didn't need to say anything to each other because we were both feeling the same thing. I could probably do a whole book of him interacting with <laughs> little kids. Here, here's, he's getting zapped in, into a spider web, um, showing kids how to do a selfie. He started calling himself the baby whisperer after this sequence. You see, Michelle had picked up this baby at the congressional picnic. You see what he's trying to do. Here's what happened next. <laughs> and then here he is carrying uh, the twin boys of his legislative director, Katie Byrne Fallon. 
Um, and this picture was taken in 2011, I think. Uh, he had gone to Sasha's school for a parent-teacher event. And as he was walking to the, back to the motorcade, he saw that there was a daycare center next door and these kids were hanging out the window. And so he told the Secret Service, I'm just going to walk over there and say hi to these kids. And this is Prince George at Kensington Palace. Now, this was especially a poignant moment for me because unbeknownst to probably anybody else in the room, 25 years before I made this picture, I made a picture of Prince George's grandmother dancing with John Travolta at the White House at a state dinner. And I'll just end with a, a few pictures from Inauguration Day. Um, the tradition is the president-elect comes to the White House for a reception before the inauguration. And I'll just show you there to President's Encounter. Kind of reminds me of the Godfather or something like that. And then I'll just kind of skip over the whole inauguration and show you as they're leaving. And we went back inside the Capitol and Michelle said bye to the Bidens. Uh, we boarded a helicopter on the east side of the Capitol to fly away to Joint Base Andrews where they got to use Air Force One one last time. And the pilot of the helicopter um, as he was headed to Joint Base Andrews, uh, did a detour and flew um, over the White House. Um, so they had one last look at the place that they had lived for eight years. Hi, Mr. Sousa. Thank Hi. you so much. Uh, my, I'm Robin McNair, the moderator that Madeline mentioned earlier. And thank you for that very powerful and evocative experience that we just had with you. And what we're going to do now is we're going to ask you some questions. I know that we have a very curious audience that's comprised of artists and authors and activists and people of all kinds in our community that would love to be able to ask and hear some, uh, some answers from you about our curiosities. So this is how it's going to work. I have a couple of questions that I prepared in advance, and I want to continue to encourage the audience to please put their uh, questions in the chat and then we'll field them to you as they come in. So our first question is, as a photographer, storyteller, historian, artist, and author, how did you develop your storytelling voice? You know, this is, that's, a, that's a hard thing to, uh, to answer in a, in a concise way. Um, I think that it's something you, you learn over time. Um, for me, um, I, I, my, the early part of my career was at small newspapers in Kansas. And um, I think that's where it kind of uh, really started to, to understand um, pictures that really help tell stories. And there, there's something too about um, working at a small newspaper where you're oftentimes seeing the people that you photographed and whose pictures appear in the paper, you see them later, you see them a week later, a month later. And um, people talk to you in the community, they write letters to the editor, and you get a sense of which pictures really resonate with people. Not that they always like them, because they didn't always. Um, but I think, I, I think that's how I developed my authentic voice. So at what point did you transition from photographer to journalist or was your start as a journalist into photographer? How, what was your journey like? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting that um, I, I really didn't know what I was lost in high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I um, thought about sports, uh, 24 hours a day and I was a terrible athlete. <laughs> um, and so I thought that, well, maybe I'll become a sports writer. That'd be kind of cool. So that was my intention when I went to uh, journalism, journalism school at Boston University. And then I took a photography class. 
And uh, I think it was the magic of photography. You know, this is back in the old black and white days where you're developing the film. And um, I was like, it was magic. I, this is what I, you know, I knew that was what I wanted to do. You know, I've often thought about, well, what if I had, what if I had gotten that bug earlier and I hadn't gone to journalism school, but I had gone to a photography, you know, just a regular photography school or a, you know, an art school, you know, I, I mean, it just happened to be that I was in um, a journalism school and I guess, uh, I guess that's why I became a photojournalist. It's, it's not like I had that, you know, aspiration necessarily, but, you know, once I left Boston university, I certainly did. I was like, okay, I want to, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that I got to do when I was at BU is intern at the Associated Press. And all of a sudden I'm on, you know, courtside at the Boston Celtics games and I'm, you know, covering uh, NHL hockey. And I'm like, how cool is this? You know? So I think that, uh, it, it, you know, during those really two years, last two years at BU that I was like, okay, this is somehow I got to, figure out how to make this a job, you know, and that took me another year before I got a, well, actually it took me three more years before I got a, my first job at a newspaper, but I kind of like knew that's, that's the direction I was headed. Well, it sounds like you said yes to a lot of opportunities that came your way. And as mentioned before, I do represent a lot of students in arts education in the Santa Ana Unified School District. And I know we have a lot of our youth in the audience. And one of the questions that's come in from the audience is, did anything or could anything have prepared you for such an amazing experience? Um, you know, I think that um, in, in, in many ways, I, say, I like to tell people, look, I am not the best photographer in the world, but I think that I, I was the absolute right person to be Barack Obama's photographer. I mean, I, I, I had experienced so much already in my career. I, I had, you know, having worked at the White House, having worked for newspapers, I freelanced for National Geographic. So I understood color and light uh, better. And I don't know that I could have done that job in the Obama administration if I had not been, uh, you know, I was in my fifties when I started, I think there's something to be said for, for being a seasoned guy. Cause I was totally comfortable and confident uh, and nothing really phased me. And I think that would have been harder to do if I had been in my twenties or thirties. And I think that's why I was a little overwhelmed during the Reagan years in some way. I mean, I, th I think I made some good pictures, but not at the same level of access that I had with uh, President Obama, where I was, you know, there for everything. Um, and so, I mean, I just kind of felt prepared, just everything that happened in my career. I mean, it's funny, Matt, I, should, I should tell your, the, the, the younger people that, because, um, you know, when Joe Biden was elected, I had multiple emails from people saying, hey, I want to be his photographer. And, you know, and I looked at their portfolio and it was, you know, it was like pictures of politicians at a podium. And so, like, how do I say to somebody, look, you just are not good enough. You're not experienced enough. If you really want to become a White House photographer, you have to demonstrate that you can photograph your local politician behind the scenes. Um, this, you know, this, you know, you got to you got to you got to work hard, basically. Um, the other thing I tell your students or young people um, is, you know, one of the great things about photography is there's all kinds of different photographers. And, um, you know, I have a friend, all he does is photograph music. I have friends that all they do is photograph sports. I have friends that all just do portraits, you know, with big production lights and, I have a friend that all he does is photograph food at restaurants, basically for different restaurants. I have friends that shoot weddings. I mean, there's so many different kinds of genre of photography that one of the things young people or students need to try to start thinking about is 
what kind of photographer do they want to be? Does it fit their personality? Does it fit their expertise? I mean, for me, my kind of photography is trying to capture these fleeting moments. That takes a certain skill. I've gotten better at it over the years. Um, and, it, and it just, that kind of photography really fit well uh, at the White House. And to capture those kind of fleeting moments, just you have to be so ready. So what advice do you have for being very present to be able to be in the moment to capture those fleeting moments? I mean, I think probably to, to be, uh, to try to take everything in, everything that's happening and not, not just randomly photographing, but really thinking about what you're trying to say or what's important. You know, I, Michael Williamson, a photographer a friend of mine, likes to say, you've got to decide what to keep in and what to keep out of the photograph. You know, what makes a good photograph? That's something that you learn over time. And, um, you know, I don't know how else to say it other than that. It, I, I think it also helps, like, in, especially working at the White House in these really sensitive situations is, is, is just being really stealthy and not... Um, you know, you're not there to be a participant. You're there to be an observer with a camera. And you got, you have to know that. And you have to be as quiet and unobtrusive as possible. Another question that came in from our audience is, how did you stay safe while you took your photographs? Because you had such an inner access to the president and others. And how did you stay in the moment with so much going on? Uh, again, I think it's just, you know, uh, a wealth of experience and having been in, and uh, I mean, I showed you some pictures of Af Afghanistan. I had several, you know, really close calls. Um, and I like to tell people that, you know, when I was at the White House, I didn't have any bullets flying over my head. I didn't have any rocket propelled, rocket propelled grenades being, you know, coming my way. So, um it's it's a different kind of pressure. It's not it's not scary at all, and it's just uh, as I said earlier. I said I felt confident and um, and uh, I, I felt that I belong there. I, I, I really did. Well, uh, another question from our audience is: Well, first of all, they are saying thank you, and it was amazing and moving. And it seems that you were on the scene 24 seven. So how many hours a day on average did you spend? Um, you know, I, I never really added it up. And I, I think every day was different. I mean, usually, um, you know, President Obama thankfully didn't start that early. So that was good. So I usually get to the White House around eight. And then, I, you know, I'd usually be home by eight. Um, Seven, between 7.30 and 8, probably. And then uh, I'd say maybe two or three days a week, uh, you know, there'd be something at night I'd have to stay. And, you know, sometimes I'd be there till midnight or one, just with the pen. Uh, and then weekends, first couple of years in the, in the weekends, I probably worked every weekend day. I mean, every weekend, both days. And then uh, the last, I tried to take Sundays off unless unless he was doing something. Um, you know, out during the summer, he would often go golfing on Sundays. And I, I just, I, I would, I would send one of my staff to, to do that. So it sort of gave me a reprieve, but if he was doing something official on Sunday, I would come in still. Um, so it's hard to qualify like how many hours, total hours. Yeah, it's I, not a nine to five was, for sure. Right. <laughs> no, it was not nine to five. Uh, another question from our, our audience is, as you captured the humanity of some of the most powerful people on earth, what aspects of either Obama or Reagan did you experience that you sought to incorporate into your own life? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the one similarity between Reagan and Obama is they, they both were pretty even tempered. Um, I mean, I saw both of them get really pissed off, but it would take a lot, you know, it'd take a lot to get their blood boiling that way. 
And, um, I, I, you know, and I think that um, it's funny, I think by nature, I'm, I'm, I'm a very impatient person. I think they're very patient. Both of those, both of them were very patient. I'm, it, it, I mean, I'm patient when it comes to waiting for a photograph to, you know, something to happen, but I'm impatient about everything else. So I'm trying to become more patient, I guess. And trying to um, trying to be you know kind to people, I guess, if you will. Those are very great attributes to incorporate into our lives. Another question from the audience is, what is the size of the archive that you created during the Obama presidency? Yeah, so. <clears throat> It, uh, I shot the, the somebody at the archives actually tallied the, the number. I just I shot 1.9 million photos. Every single one was archived. They're not now at the National Archives. And there was some uh, uh, there was some um, confusion about photos that I. I started doing some photos on my iPhone, my personal iPhone, like of, you know, not of the president, but just sort of like, you know, the plane, looking out the window of the plane or um, pictures in the Rose Garden, that kind of thing for, uh, for Instagram. Uh, and, and there was some confusion about, I thought I only had to archive the ones that I posted on Instagram. So let me, uh, th- th- so there was some confusion about whether those were considered, you know, presidential records or not. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, they were all interspersed with my personal photos. So it took me a while after we left office to get those all together. So I just sent, well, I guess last year, sent a hard drive of all my White House iPhone photos and so that adds another 51,000 pictures <laughs> to the archive. Wow. Spectacular. Uh, another question from our audience is how in the world did you find the stamina to keep up with the presidents? And over time, did you find that you sort of knew, could guess based on experience when something you really need to f- photograph would happen? Um, well, uh, stamina. Uh, I don't know how I did it. I mean, um, it took a lot out of me physically. There's no question. But I, you know, I took one sick day in eight years. And the only reason I took a sick day is because I had to undergo anesthesia. So uh, I was trying to get the doctor to do it at three o'clock in the morning so that I could still come into work, but just for for a minor procedure. but, you know, I just, I, 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 I saw President Obama work when he had a sinus infection or a cold. And so I was like, well, if he can do it, then I, then I can do it too. Um, and so, you know, I just, um, you know, you just, you, you, you just learn how to, how to do it. There were some days it was really hard though, I have to say. Um, and I'm already forgot what the second part of the question was. Um, well, how were, how did you know when to be in the moment or it, yeah. just ha- when the moments yeah. would manifest it's, themselves and you were the right place at the right time? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, again, it's just experience over time. You sort of, you sort of can anticipate these things. And then when you're essentially spending every day with the same person, you get to know, like you you can almost, almost predict you know, the way he's going to interact with somebody. And, and, and so that helps, that certainly helps you help me be ready for the, for the, for the moment. Um, it's, I, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story is um, we, we, uh, we were in uh, uh, doing some event in Newport, Rhode Island, I think it was. And the, uh, I'm, I'm usually on his helicopter or the second helicopter on this particular day. I was on the se- second helicopter. We land before him and they, they landed in the, the, the helicopter landing zone was not far from the ocean, maybe like 50 yards, hundred yards from the ocean. And our helicopter lands first. He's supposed to get out of the helicopter and walk to the motorcade and we drive away. And I like, 
as soon as I land, I go right to the ocean, which is like not really near the motorcade. And the Secret Service are like, why are you over there? And I said, because he's going to walk down here. <laughs> I just knew he would. You know, the sun was setting. It was just a beautiful scene. It kind of looked like Hawaii. I was like, he's going to walk. I know he's going to walk down there. And sure enough, he walked down there and I got this beautiful picture because I yes, knew he was going to walk down there. You know your subject well. I know my subject. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. President Obama demonstrated being such a personal and authentic leader and such vulnerability to allow himself to be captured in these moments that you came to know him intimately so that you could capture those moments. And that, that's how we have this eyewitness to history. So another question from our audience is, did you remember feeling the weight of your job at any particular time as the White House photographer? I mean, I think the, yeah, there were certain times when usually when a crisis was going on and, you know, let's talk about the Bin Laden raid. Um, you know, it was clear to me at the start of that day that th this was going to be a historic day. And, you know, we didn't know whether the raid would be successful or not, but it's still going to be historic no matter what happens. And so, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you're saying to yourself, you know, pay attention to everything that's going on, every little thing that might not be so important right this second, but maybe, you know, over time, something that you, that, that's happening that you might not photograph might turn out to be relevant. And so I think I was hypersensitive to everything that was going on today. And, you know, you know, you say to yourself, don't screw it up, <laughs> you know, cause you, you know, you're the only one there. You're the only one photographing. So you, you, you just, you're hyper aware of everything that's going on. And, and a follow-up question that came in too is how many people were in your team at the White House? So <clears throat> at three other photographers, because we covered the first lady and the vice president, they're solo events. And then when any kind of a public event that the president was doing, uh, th there were the photographers on my staff would be positioned with the press because uh, oftentimes the head on position or the, the side position is, is the best picture from those public events. And my job was really doing the behind the scenes stuff. So I'd kind of come into the room with him at the last minute. And so I'd have people already pre-positioned. So, you know, for the, the historical archive, we have a good record of every public event from multiple angles. And I had, you know, photo editor, a couple of photo editors and, a photo archivist. Um, so, and then, you know, I'll just talk about small world. Those of you, I'll just say this really briefly and some, some people will get it or some people won't, but Anna Ruck, who uh, uh, was one of the women that uh, spoke out about Governor Cuomo was my office manager at the White House you know, small world. That is a small world. Well, another question from our audience is, how many cameras did you carry with you during a typical day in the White House? And what lens for those cameras, if in fact you carried more than one? Yeah, I carry two cameras. I usually carried um, a 35 millimeter lens on, on one camera and a 50 or a 135 or an 85 uh, on the other. And then I would, uh, a third lens would be strapped uh, to a lens pouch on my belt. So usually two cameras, three lenses with me. And um, one, once uh, the, uh, there's a 24 to 70 zoom lens, which some, some people might be familiar with, when Canon released their second version of that, uh, it, it, it met my, quality tests. So I started using that a lot too. Ah, thank you from all the photographers in our audience. Uh, and another question is, what was your relationship with the C Secret Service like? Oh, I had a great relationship with them. Um, 
I mean, it's interesting. I mean, the Secret Service had no role in terms of telling me what I could and couldn't do in terms of photography. That was not their role. But it, so the only uh, the only time they would um, you know sort of be involved with me on any anything is if and I use this as an example um, if if he was doing an event. Uh, and there's a stage, there's always three staircases. There's one coming up the back, one on each side. And what they would never want me to do is block that stairwell, like, or sit on the stairwell, because that's, the, you know, that's their exit route if something goes awry. Um, and, and you know, they were so great in terms of, like, if he was working on a rope line, meaning after an event, he's like, in the crowd and the secret service are really on top of him. They would literally let me, you know, be right touching them. I mean, they didn't care if I was in there with them. Um, so I can't say enough great things about the secret service and, and letting me do my job. Uh, and, you know, and quite frankly, they went beyond what they're supposed to do where if, if uh, oftentimes on a, uh, if I was in another country, sometimes the host government security did, didn't, you know, would hassle me. And there were times where they came to my rescue, which they, you know, that was not their job, but they, they did. Uh, and I always appreciated that. Well, that's the power of collaboration and strong relationships. So it sounds like a very positive dynamic with the secret service and a, great glimpse into what goes on behind the scenes. Another question is, what is the thing you miss most about seeing President Barack Obama? And what was one of the most important conversations that you had with him? Yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I, I miss his camaraderie and I sort of miss, um, you know, I think, I think most of the people that I work with feel the same way. We miss the collegial atmosphere of working at the White House. And it's, it's, it's sort of like, it, it's, it's a work family, but it's, and it's a big work family. And it's a work family that involves not just um, the, uh, you know, Obama appointees, but the other people that work at the White House, the butlers, the chefs, the groundskeepers, uh, you get to know all these people and, and, you know, they're part of the family, even, and, you know, I don't even know their, their politics, it, but, you know, you just knew them as people. And then January 20 comes and everybody, the family completely breaks up. Everybody goes their separate ways. And it's just, that's been the hardest thing is, um, I mean, I'm still, there it is, what, four years and three in two months and I'm still on a text chain with three of my closest colleagues, you know, matter of fact, we were texting yesterday back and forth, um, you know, cause, it, and, and I never see them hardly. Um, but it's, it's, so that's been the hardest thing. And with him, I mean, I try not to bother him that much. I, when I, 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 I don't live in DC anymore. When I lived in DC, I'd stop by his office every once in a while just to say hi and now we communicate mostly via text. Um, so, Well, that was another beautiful moment in your documentary, The Way I See It, how you captured President Obama saying goodbye to everybody in the family, all the people that you mentioned and the beautiful moments that they had. So, gosh, there's questions coming in and we're getting close on time, but I do want to ask this question. Uh, this audience member said, I admire your devotion to the job of photographing President Obama. What do you think it was that would make you stay in your office during a snowstorm so that you didn't miss a picture? That seems like above and beyond. I mean, there's something to be said for um, the, the, well, I took the job seriously. And um if if you're if the one thing I learned in my career is um, if you don't show up, you are definitely not going to make a picture. 
And um, if you show up, there's a chance that you can make a picture that's um, important or historical or maybe not. And I think the, you know, my thinking was, um, I, I, I have, this, uh, this is the only, you know, of course I did it during the Reagan years, but this is, this is the only time I'm ever going to have this opportunity and I'm not going to miss anything. That was sort of my approach. And, um, and, and it, it, you know, sometimes it was hard. Uh, I missed, the, I missed a lot of weddings and funerals and birthday parties, you know, personal ones. But I, you know, I felt that I, in order to do this job the right way, you just have to be there all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I imposed that on myself. I, as I said, I had staff. So if I, if I wanted to not come in for the snowstorm, I could have, um, you know, not been there. And, um, but, you know, that's just not who I am. It's just like, I just didn't want to miss anything. It's, well, it's, it's, we, we call it, we call it FOMA, fear FOMA. of missing anything. Yes, exactly. We, I've call it, often call it FOMO, fear of missing out. So same idea. Same thing. And great counsel, show up and seize opportunities, say yes when they come to you. Yeah. And our, our audience wants to know, what is the most important photograph to you that you've ever taken? Um, you know, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I don't really think that way. You know, I, 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 I don't, I always thought about, um, uh, that, that picture was gonna, was gonna happen tomorrow. So be ready, you know, and it's, 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 it's one thing that sort of kept me going is um uh you know uh, uh, tomorrow tomorrow might be the day and and to think to think that to think that every day there's this there's this uh bar in lawrence kansas um and they have a sign on the window and the sign says free beer tomorrow (laughs) you know um, so that's sort of like my attitude, like just wor- worry about tomorrow because that might be the day. Wonderful advice. Our time is coming to a close. We're so thankful that you have been here with us to speak to our community. And the last thing we want to know, uh, the concluding question is, what are you taking photos of these days? <laughs> um. COVID has is, is, is shut me down a lot, um, you know, in that age group where I've got to be super careful. Um, so I haven't done a lot of photojournalism last year. I've covered a few of the protests here in Madison, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm more trying to stay healthy. Just got my first vaccine shot yesterday, knock on wood. So, um, so mostly photographing uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, kind of scenics around town, and uh, I, I have a, gra- a new granddaughter, so I, I, you know, um, I hate to admit how many pictures I've taken of her already. Um, so she's she's probably my n- number one subject right now. And that's lovely that you get to see her and spend that kind of time, and. Yeah it's great to see that you're staying in your practice and continue to photograph things. And, and a lot of the arts have terribly been impacted as we know by COVID. So we hope to see a Renaissance happen once we get through this time. And I have to say, you know, what, just one last thing is one of the interesting things that happened in this town is we were affected by the protests, like a lot of cities and, you know, although 97% of the protests were um, peaceful, there were a few outliers, you know, downtown Madison, and it caused 
um, businesses all to put up plywood on all their windows, you know, which was sad to see. But in this town, um, the arts community came out and did these amazing uh, murals and paintings and portraits of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of Black women power. Just It was just really extraordinary to see. And um, uh, so I think the arts community in some ways came to the rescue here in this town to give people a more positive uh, outlook of what was happening in the country. Yeah, and we have a robust uh, mural activity going on here in Santa Ana. And you're right, like we have the first responders that have helped to save lives during this time. And it's the artists who are helping us to heal. So we thank you because this whole festival that you're a part of is that part of bringing the arts to the community and, and coming together and bringing that healing that we need and joyful opportunities to be together. So thank you so much. It's been such an honor to get this time with you and we wish you continued success and we'll be following you. So thanks again. Well, thank you. And, and thanks we thank our audience for being here. Yeah, thanks yeah. for everybody out there. You're amazing. Thanks. Thank you. You bet. Take care. <laughs>